Hey everybody, how you doing? Webinar number six, Chance Rush. I wanna thank the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute for giving us this opportunity to present Telenative. Um, man, this is our sixth webinar. I'm Chance Rush, I'm your moderator today. And I'll tell you this, anybody out there listening that has heard this panel before, thank you guys for making each webinar stronger, stronger, and stronger today. It is so crazy, man. I've got a crazy lineup with you today of individuals who are just doing it, you know, and uh, we're gonna talk about so much today. Um, to everybody out there, obviously, you know, we're having these webinars uh, because it seems right now that the world has stopped, you know, with uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. I know you're at home quarantining, all that good stuff. And so we just wanna encourage you guys to keep up the good fight. You know, things are gonna get better for all of us. Play your part. Uh, wash your hands, wear your mask, social distance, don't go out if you, if you don't have to. Anybody out there going through anything, you know, we, we care about you, we love you, we're praying for you. I know things are going to get better. Uh, so with that being said, this is why we are uh, pushing uh, Telenative, you know, we want you all to uh, continue to, um, you know, uh, just uh, um, tune in. Uh, next weekend, we have another great lineup. Uh, speaking of lineup, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm gonna I want to take this time to turn it over to our uh, our panel as we get started. So uh, let's start with uh, we'll go ladies first, and uh, whenever our guests can jump jump on, we'll do that. But Isabel, let's start with you, and we'll just do we'll do ladies first. Here we go. It's Jay. My name is Isabel Coronado. I'm a policy entrepreneur with The Next 100, as well as a youth advisory board member with the Center for Native American Youth. Teresa? Hasla Hale, Teresa Sheldon Seedsta, Tuol Chadu Flalup. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Sheldon, Tulalip Tribe Citizen, and with the DNC as the Native American Political Director. Thanks for having me. All right. And my main man, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Temez Pochel. I'm also Pacific First Nations Cree, Shichanga Lakota, and Black, and I uh, currently serve on the Center for Native Americans Youth Advisory Board as the Vice Chair. All right. Well, thank you. And I know that uh, uh, Paulette Jordan will be uh, joining us here in a little bit. And, you know, before we uh, get ready, you know, before uh, she introduce her, herself, uh, we'll kind of go in and just get into like a, some, some just some general questioning here. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, this this week um, our topic is decolonizing democracy, and I know it's it, it seems like that's everywhere to all of the uh, to listeners back home. Um, tune in, man. Text somebody, message somebody, tell them you know this topic that we're talking about is very important because. You know, even though that, you know, we can go in a lot of different directions with this title, uh, our, our panel today is going to uh, give us some uh, different perspectives anywhere from, you know, knowing our treaties, uh, voting, uh, having a voice, speaking up, uh, get involved with the census. I mean, you name it, you know, we're, we're talking about it right now. Indian country is going through a lot, whether it's, you know, reclaiming our land or, or, or letting people know that this has always been our land to uh, uh, some changes that are taking place in Indian country, to uh, taking a stand for something. This is exactly what we need to talk about this week. So with that being said, um, you know, we, like I said that word, decolonizing democracy. You know, uh, in, in your own terms, can each one of you uh, explain uh, what, what the, that, that title means to you? We'll go with Anthony. Sure. Um, so uh, obviously, like we stated before, right, I think it I think that means um, it can mean many different things uh, for many different people. Um, also, depending on where you live, right, it, it, you know, what what tribal nation is in that area or what connection you have to the land. Um, but, but I think decolonizing democracy to me, you know, is um, being involved in a process that was created uh, you know, to, to keep us uninvolved, right? Um, it's making sure that the people that we're electing into offices are aware of treaties in our area. You know, here in Chicago, we have two treaties that cover 
uh, covers the Chicagoland area. That's the Treaty of Greenville and the Treaty of Chicago, right? And so making sure when we elect those peoples into office that they know those treaties and they know, you know, Native people's treaty rights. Uh, but that's also making sure that we're uh, voting, right? We're going out and we're voting and we're participating in, in our, our current democracy, right? Um, and so that's making sure that you know, Native people have a voice in that, you know, historically, they don't want you to vote. And so when you don't go out and vote, or when you don't participate, you know, we're giving them what they want. People have, you know, some people have reasons why they don't vote. And, you know, it's important not to dismiss those, uh, because everyone's opinions and feelings are, are validated. That's, I think that's part of being um, indigenous, right, is making sure that we're all heard. Uh, democracy, I think, is an indigenous practice. Uh, and we can take what we currently have, um, this Western idea of uh, democracy, and indigenize it and make it work for our own communities. Wow. Thank you for that, Anthony. Thank you for those words. Well, I do appreciate it. Uh, I know that we just had a Paulette. Paulette Jordan, uh, she, I think she just now tuned in. Uh, hey, Paulette, are you, are you with us? How you doing? Maybe introduce yourself and we'll get rolling here. Okay. Oh, there you go, Paulette. How you doing there, Paulette? You might, are you on mute? Oh. Okay, there you go. Okay. Well, okay, how are you doing? Doing good, brother. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> so, so maybe you can introduce yourself to our listeners and, and, and explain to us what you think, uh, you know, you, your, your terms of... Uh, decolonizing democracy? My terms. Well, well, first of all, my name is Paula Jordan. I am um, born and raised on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation in Northern Idaho. And uh, it's really an honor to be here amongst all of you. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me and doing this. And thank you, Chance. You know, you're my brother for life. I, I've known you uh, all along the way. Just super thankful that you're here and always supporting our youth in the best way possible. Uh, but I want to make sure that people understand just how incredibly important it is for all of you to participate, and this is part of that, uh, having conversations like this, whether we're talking about decolonizing democracy or uh, just getting people on all levels of government, uh, and our people from rural America, you know, out in Indian country, a lot of our young people you know, have that right to step up, uh, not only just to participate by voting, but leading in this process, because more people need mm -hmm. that it comes back to uh, basically, uh, in every single room from business to politics, that uh, very few people hear the indigenous voice, which comes with a whole uh, centuries a list of uh, values of um, greatness, in my opinion, because there are so many people who, uh, the great leaders that we can look back upon, who have done so many powerful things, and they've done that with uh, this formidable spirit, you know, and they've been unchallenged in so many ways because they did it with a good heart for their people. And I see that being lost in politics. I see that being lost in business uh, and in the world today that's hurting so much, which is why I see that we have a prime opportunity here to really discuss what are the next steps moving forward because we wanna make sure that all of our young people are prepared for these next steps because these next levels that we're about to breach into, uh, that's gonna be amazing for not only this country by uniting both the left and the right, but uniting all who are economically suppressed, those who are uh, challenged, you know, in healthcare and education, uh, in all walks of life. You know, we're seeing that with the Black Lives Matter movement. So, uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation first and foremost. And again, thank you all for having me. Good. Thank you for those words, Paula. We do appreciate. It. We're going to hear from uh, all y'all here in a little bit. Uh, uh, Isabel, uh, decolonizing democracy. So when I saw this question and I thought about it, I automatically went to um, the big decision that happened just a few, a, a week ago, um, which is the Supreme Court decision uh, saying that Muscogee Creek Nation is in fact uh, a reservation, something we've always known. Um, and being Muscogee Creek myself, um, I went in and read the brief and um, what those policies were saying. And while reading it, I just saw over and over um, how their tactics were to one, assimilate us, and then two, to assimilate us by taking away native land ownership. And so when I think about decolonizing democracy, I think about smashing down those racist policies that do, do those kinds of things to marginalize communities. And so that's something that we shouldn't be doing to marginalize communities. And by decolonizing de democracy, we're opening up um, ways to, to 
um, have more equity, equality for people with different skin colors, economic status, or even gender identities. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. We'll talk a little more about that here in a, here in a little bit. Uh, Teresa, decolonizing democracy. Yeah, I'm over here like, woo, yes, get it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, agree with all the statements shared. I think for me, decolonizing democracy means showing up as my full self, like showing up as my full indigenous self, um, who is not going to apologize for standing up and saying as a political class of people with inherent rights, with treaty rights, with constitutional rights, with all of the uh, every kind of right that we have, I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm going to show up, I'm going to defend it, and I'm going to explain why everyone else should be on our side because we are always on the right side of history and the right side of the law. You know, and so um, when we look at democracy, and just like Anthony said, so uh, precise was that's always been a way of our people doing. We've always sat down, we've always discussed, we've always um, debated back and forth on issues and came to a consensus and came to an understanding of, of respect and why we're doing something. And that's really what democracy is about, is being able to hear each other and listen to each other's answers and responses um, and go forward. And it's so important um, now that we are using our full voice in whatever aspect that is, if it's social media, if it's policy writing, if it's on the streets, if it's protesting, um, if it's organizing, you know, making phone calls, emailing senators, running for political office, um, all of those, we don't have to be less than, right? We get to show up as our full, authentic um, Native representation. And, and we don't have to try to downplay who we are any longer. And I think that's just the blessing um, of, of the people who've come before us and have allowed this so that we can be the full selves. Um, and I've never liked that analogy, we have one foot in two worlds. I say we are our full self in, in one world and we're no longer going to apologize for that, right? So if we show up in our ribbon shirts and our ribbon skirts and our regalia. And if we show up in our hoodies and our t-shirts and our yoga pants, like that's us, right? And so um, it, there, there's no one way to be. All of it is legit um, when we are true to our, who we are um, ourselves. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for that. You know, um, you know speaking of uh, working together, I know that, um, you know, prior to working for the uh, uh, the DNC, uh, you worked, uh, you, you, you know, did outreach through uh, Emily's List. Um, that was a national Native American training to get and promote uh, more Native American women into uh, political positions and whatnot. I know it was a success. And why isn't, you know, with, with the success, uh, shed some light on why it's important. Uh, and, and we're seeing it now with, uh, with uh, Paulette running for, for senator up in Idaho, you know. Why is it more important, more and more, we need more of our Indian women to, uh, to get into the political realm. Well, Native representation matters, right? And so we see that with Congresswoman Holland and Congresswoman Davids, how, how invisible we really are. And when you have two Native women elected who are just powerhousing and making dynamic changes, and they're constantly saying, we are so proud and thankful to be the first, but we can't be the last. And, and we're putting the ladder down to bring other sisters um, to join us as well. And so Emily's List, we had a beautiful opportunity to work with them um, for over a year in creating a Native American Run to Win training program. And the whole intent is we have to extend that the same opportunities everyone else gets, we have to go out of our way to ensure Native people are receiving and having access. And so access is not, and we see that with broadband, just basic access isn't equal um, in Indian country. And so we have to work with um, creating space. And so national organizations that are doing phenomenal work, if they are not including Native American as a piece to that, they're not, they're not fitting the full spectrum of who we are as Americans, right? And so 
half of our battles are constantly saying, excuse me, um, who's your native person? Where is your native um, media? Where is, where is this? What's your inclusion? And so um, Emily's List started the program. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of work to do, but they're trying. And so that's a beautiful aspect uh, that a lot of people aren't doing yet. And so you're seeing a huge need, though, to train native candidates in how to run for a public political office. And um, there's a beautiful thing Kevin Killer and a group are doing is creating advanced Native American um, political training. And they hope to roll that out in 2021. And Indians List uh, used to do this. Indians List used to have a train the trainer, um, how to run for office. And also we need Native organizers. Um, we don't, we just, we need candidates and we need Native organizers to help our candidates um, get elected. And so all of it's needed and we need more of it and we need more people um, to run. But when we ask our people to run, we Indian country have to provide support to them and we have to get behind them and encourage them. And if that's positive Facebook messages, positive Twitter, positive, um, you know, be a part of uplifting and supporting and financially donating $5, $10, $20 um, to our native candidates and, and buying their merchandise, buying their t-shirts, you know, um, going and, and making phone calls for them. Like we can't just leave it up to everyone else, um, but Indian country, we need to, to get more involved and more engaged as well. Yeah, and I'm glad that you say that, you know, as a, as a political figure for us in Indian country, because you're right, we do have to support, we do have to get involved. We're seeing it right now, you know, with, you know, the level that you're on, the level that, you know, uh, uh, Paulette is on, you know, and just to see, you know, these two here with this, you know, Isabel and Anthony, you know, at Young Minds and they're doing what they're doing, you know. So my next question is for Isabel. Is, uh, Isabel, you know, you moved to New York City to start working for Next 100. Uh, it's a, a, you know, political think tank. You know, we're very proud of you. Um, what is your priorities there and how can Native youth get involved? Yes, I moved all the way from Oklahoma to join a think tank in New York. Um, it was a, it's been an incredible um, opportunity. Um, at Next 100, I'm working on criminal justice reform, specifically in incarceration around indigenous communities, because whether we know it or not, incarceration is a huge um, issue in, in, in Indian country. And I know this firsthand um, because of the work I was doing in Oklahoma with reentry um, with uh, the tribal members all over Oklahoma. And um, in Oklahoma, we're one of the number one mass incarcerators. And one, breaking that down even further, we're incarcerating Native women um, even further. And that's in the world. So just breaking down those numbers, like we have a really big issue. Um, and so taking that experience and also my personal experience as having um, formerly incarcerated parents, um, I wanted to create opportunities for the next generation of children who have to grow up with uh, an incarcerated parent and um, working through those barriers and also having the opportunities because I know we're so much more than uh, the problem and the issues. Um, and then how Native youth can get involved. Uh, the number one thing I say, it sounds easy, but it takes a lot of work too, is to share their stories. Um, I just realized how powerful um, a personal narrative can be, especially when talking to elected officials and trying to get policy changes in your area. Um, it's been incredibly beneficial, um, letting people know the issues, but also backing it up with real life experience. Wow. You're right. You know, and, and we do. We, we got to, our Native youth have to get involved. I mean, I know we can talk about voting. We can talk about, you know, the census. We can talk about, you know, supporting. But, you know, our Native youth, even ones that aren't even old enough to vote, we, we, we've got to get involved. You know, we've got to understand this. You know, speaking of getting involved, Anthony, I was talking to you earlier about you being everywhere. I was out in D.C. He was there. I was out in Phoenix. He was there. I was up in some place. He was, he's always just showing up, you know. And uh, thank you for being involved. I know that you've uh, uh, been engaged uh, for many years and, you know, living in Chicago, um, you know, and, and being a native, you know, how is it for urban natives and what's the landscape, you know, when it comes to uh, getting involved with, uh, with voting and, um, you know, how, how, you know, what's some challenges that could be, you know, with, you know, spreading the message out there for native voting in urban, in urban settings? Yeah. So, 
you know, one, Chicago is, is definitely just, a, it's a different type of animal when it comes to making sure people are getting involved. Just the history there alone with, you know, making sure people are involved in a democratic process, right, uh, in our democracy has just been a challenge just for, for all Chicagoans. Um, you know, I think one of, like a big challenge that we have here in the city is, you know, uh, as opposed to, to other native communities, right? In the city, you know, we're not all in one area, you know, we're spread out and we all have different voting precincts. And so, you know, a lot of the times we can't vote in blocks, right? So it's harder to get people that we want that will a advance our agendas or, or our truths um, into office because we don't have that same political power, right? You know, we are, our community is made up of, you know, hundreds of different nations, um, which is a beautiful thing because as a native youth, you know, I'm, you know, I'm able, you know, I've been thankful enough. This is where my people are originally from. And so, you know, growing up on my ancestral territory, um, you know, in, in a concrete jungle, I've been able to learn so much. Uh, but beyond that, I can learn, you know, native elders cultures in my community. Um, so when I travel, I'm able to be, you know, respectful of that, but, you know, it, it, getting people to polls or getting people involved in the process is a very hard thing, right? We still have native elders in our community that have never voted uh, before in their lives. Um, this past election, we, we actually got a couple to vote. It was the first time um, uh, they were in their, they were in their fifties. And so, you know, that's a, that, you know, those things are our success stories, but it's important to note that, you know, the political power that, uh, you know, tribal nations have is very different and the political power that, you know, urban natives have, right? And so it is, you know, I believe that it is our job, you know, living in urban areas, we obviously have, we have a lot more um, access to resources, right? Um, we have a lot more access to jobs, we have a lot more access to the internet, we have uh, a lot uh, more access to, you know, to a larger network of people. And so it is our job uh, to play that supporting role uh, when it comes to um, political power for tribal nations. Um, you know, here in Illinois uh, and some of the surrounding states, we don't have, uh, there aren't any federally recognized tribes, right? And, you know, for people watching, it's important to note that that's not to say that there weren't, you know, natives here, right? I, I live in a state where one of my senators said, uh, you know, natives just got up and left, uh, which is not true, right? And that's, you know, it becomes problematic. Um, and so making sure we have to educate them on, on those issues because they, you know, in the end, they are our representation. Um, and they, you know, they do have to understand that, you know, we're not living on our, you know, on land that was, you know, given to us, but we are still living on our own land. So you have an obligation to represent us as native people still um, and making sure that that message gets across. I didn't know how easy it was to, you know, just call up your elected official and say, hey, I wanna have a meeting with you about something that I'm working on, right? And so native youth in our city have actually done that on a local level. And, um, you know, in terms of like getting a garden, right? Getting the city to hand over land to our native community to use as a cultural and education space. Um, and in part that's due to policy um, because native youth here are involved in that. And that's, you know, something that um, at first is very, can be very intimidating and very scary um, because you don't want to go into a room full of, you know, politician or businessmen and then you get shut down, right? Obviously, you know, those happen but it's important that you get your voice heard um, and that you, you know, no matter what, you're all, always speaking uh, truth about yourself and to your people because it's, you know, in the end, like Isabel said, those personal narratives of those personal story are, you know, can win uh, over minds and, and, you know, and they can change people's hearts. Um, you know, it's, it's being able to sit down with native elders and, you know, talking with them. I, you know, and saying, you know, I know voting you know, isn't important to you. It's something that was used as a tool of oppression against you. Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, the times have changed and voting for me is important. And this is why I want you to vote. And, you know, those, those help, those one-on-ones -on -ones help. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that we're able to do that here in the city. Um, and, and I think across the country in our own communities, because that's just something that has been instilled in us as a people, we always go to our elders or to our aunties 
uh, to, you know, to talk about something that kind of um, is bugging us or that we need help or guidance on. And I think, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we can kind of see that replicated on a national level, right? Like our, our aunties and our grandmas are stepping up to the plate, even on this call, you know, just three Native women in the area of policy, you know, is, is amazing because, you know, a couple of years ago, it would have just been, it would have just been men. And that's, you know, that's not okay. And now we see that this is being replicated on a national level. Our aunties are stepping up and us as youth are able to go to them and say, you know, hey, I want to, no, I want to do what you're doing in a couple of years. You know, I need help and I need, you know, I need a mentor. And that's what we have now going on, um, especially here in the city, right? Because, you know, like I said, that political power we have is very, very low. And we don't have, you know, in, in my own community and even in my state, you know, I don't have any Native people that have mm -hmm. ran for office or, or that are, you know, in office. So I have to turn to people, you know, like Paulette or, you know, like Congresswoman Davids or like Congresswoman Holland, right? Those are my examples. And I'm fine with that because, you know, there are amazing examples to look at um, and replicate here in my hometown. Mm, thank you for those words. And you're right. And you know, the reason why I, I kind of, I use the word challenge is because, um, you know, it, it is a challenge for Indians to vote. It's, it's a challenge for natives to vote, you know, and a lot of reasons why they, they don't want us to vote, you know, and so especially sometimes in the urban areas, you know, people of color do have to come together. And if there's anybody out here listening, you know, like what Anthony was saying, you know, there's elders in Chicago that can't get out to vote or know how to vote or whatever it may be. We do have to partner. We can't all stay in our own lanes. You know, we all have to come together as, as minority people, as I mean, be diverse, come together. And, and, and be people of color, you know, and, and, and push and promote it, you know. And with that being said, I'm going to go over here to uh, Paulette. You know, again, thank you for joining us. I do appreciate it. You know, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm proud of you, Paulette. I mean, you know, just uh, I remember you as an athlete and a mom, you know, and then you, you know, you ran for governor. And it was very, very, very close. Uh, one of the closest in Idaho history, as well as, you know, now you're running for senator and things look really great for you. And so we're going to continue to pray for you and lift you up, your team, your campaign, and, and, and your outreach and everything that you're doing. That being said, you know, what did, what had, what did you learn, you know, running for governor and, you know, now running, running for senator? What's, what's, what's some things that you've learned and what can you share, you know, with Native youth? Hmm. You know, like Tony says, he, he really covered a lot of good stuff there. And I, I, I would say just honestly that we need to get more of our people to run for public office and you know, I, I was doing that with uh, my Idaho Voice. It's a nonprofit that I established here in our state uh, because I want to see more young people, more young people talking about the environment and the rights of nature, and more young people talking about uh, just simple civics matters like uh, creating balance in our power system, you know, and taking money out of politics. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also clear for me that, you know, I, I came from the reservation. I didn't run as a wealthy millionaire, and I went up against all these millionaires. And as a, I you know, learn from my own experience on the front line, it's that even while the odds may still be stacked against us, there is a hunger out there in all of us for principled and moral leadership and the indigenous worldview. I was getting people from all over the world, from uh, Berlin to France, uh, and of course, they were all rooting for us. They are rooting for me to be able to run in these positions to be the, be the voice for Indian country. And I I was really humbled by that because what they're telling me is that they are starving for this indigenous worldview, uh, this perspective that we um, are missing in this country because most people from uh, local city boards to our city council to school boards and uh, local offices to governor's races and Senate races, you know, these folks have never seen a voice like ours. They've never seen this indigenous worldview and, you know, what it's like to be the ambassador of your land or to seek balance in everything that we do. And being able to talk about, you know, these principles and apply them, you know, into politics or into business and to take care of our community and, and having respect for everything. All of these principles are missing. The value system is missing. And so I'm, I'm just seeing this all across the world and know that here in our country, you know, we have a, a prime opportunity because I'm hearing from other indigenous communities around the world and they're saying that we here in the United States, we are you know, positioned to do a whole lot more with uh, the, the privilege you know, that they see that we have. We have uh, tribal treaty rights. You know, we have sovereign 
powers and uh, immunity. And we are able to now rise up once we start acknowledging that power from within, that we are all connected in this most powerful way. Uh, but I see that this is, um, this is what I've learned and I hope that other young people will see that uh, no matter what you think is up against you, you can do it. You know, and you have everything you need. It's uh, like Tony, you know, he has everything he needs. And Isabel, you know, who's doing Next 100, she has everything she needs. In fact, when she gets to these next steps, we're all going to be there, you know, because we have all been fighting, you know, and I, I was thankful that I had the, the Susan Harjos and the Wilma Mankillers and my grandmother, Lucy Covington. You know, I get all the great leaders who have helped me be here to where I am, uh, including my own mother. And I'm going to be the same way by paying it forward to other young people. But that's how we're going to make our way up and ensure that our bench, you know, with other young leaders will be ready because it's all about preparation uh, and staying involved. And just like Anthony, he's staying involved and invested. Uh, but you've got to do that. And it starts now. You, there's no time to waste. And um, the last thing I'll say is just that um, while we do need more female and indigenous people in office, it's really just a matter of, like Teresa also stated, uh, being part of organizing because our folks have to understand the system to work within it. Uh, and then we can restructure it the way it fits for everybody because it should be more egalitarian where men and women are truly equal. Uh, rights of nature should be at the table. Nature herself should be at the table. And it's funny, we have to fight for her rights, but here we are uh, because we're all suppressed. But um, that's what I want to make sure that, you know, indigenous peoples and young people and most especially understand is we are here to be ambassadors of peace. And whether it's in politics or in the, the social challenges that we are doing or as local organizers and activists, understanding that we are here first and foremost as ambassadors of peace to bring more peace to this world is essentially to me um, really best to understand at our core. Wow. Thank you for those words. And you know, you talked about your grandma and you talked about, you know, your mom, you know, a lot of people don't know this. You don't even know this, Paul, this is crazy. I'm going to tell you something for the first time. Um, I cannot believe that I watched Michael Jordan play live before. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe I was at a tournament in Washington or Portland and I watched uh, Brooker and Buck Jones over in Pendleton, I believe. And um, I watched the Dakota Warriors and no lie, uh, when I was a little bitty guy, I watched your dad. Michael uh, Jordan play before. So that's my story of watching Michael Jordan play live. Uh, uh, so, um, so thank you for that. Shout out, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that that great? I, don't, I don't think you, I didn't think that you even probably knew that, you know, that I was a little bitty guy. I don't know, we were stuck going to a powwow or something like that, but we stopped off and watched the basketball <laughs> tournament. So, uh, and, and thank you both for the good words that you have for our young ones. Real quick before, you know, I know Teresa, you got to take off here in a second, but uh, Isabel, I'm gonna come over here to you real quick. I know that you've been working in policy uh, in, in a lot of different capacities, including a briefing for Congresswoman Presley. Can you share with us about that experience and what has come from it? Yeah, so like I said, the power of story. Uh, Representative Ayanna Presley heard my story on a panel I was doing and she reached out to me and I guess it touched her because she had that same shared experience um, where she had a father that was incarcerated for many years of her childhood and just exchanging those words um, She then saw the work I was doing and reached out to me to be part of her um, Press rollout as well as give input to her um, the justice guaranteed um, Resolution where she just totally wants to overhaul our criminal injustice system and by bringing in people who are impacted by the criminal justice system because something she overly says is people closest to the power are closer to the solution and I think just man hearing a, a leader like that really has inspired me um, so when we did that rollout uh, it included so many different things in our in our criminal justice that we just want to change, like decriminalizing sex work, abolishing the death penalty, you know, making sure that um, uh, women of color and men of color are not being um, uh, overpopulated in the prison system, making sure that children are taken care of, the caregivers. I mean, this whole resolution is a true overhaul to what she wants to do. Um, so far, she has put out some bills to uh, to make those changes, but they have just stayed in the house so far because we just have a tricky um, Congress right now. 
per se. <laughs> um, but something else that really came out of it are other people are starting to see it. And uh, something like uh, Representative Holland um, is doing a, a demilitarize the police, which fits in with that. And I was able to give input on that as well, where we want to de uh, demilitarize the local, state, tribal, and federal police um, and invest in our communities. Um, and so that's what's come out of it so far. I'm very helpful. Uh, very grateful and looking forward to the future of uh, the amazing things like the congresswomen are doing right now. And amazing things that you're going to do, you know, and I, and I know your mom would be very proud of you. And <laughs> wow, I'm so honored to know you guys. Um, Teresa, you worked in uh, governmental affairs as a policy analysis uh, for seven years prior to being elected to the uh, Tulalip Board of Directors. Uh, where you serve two terms. Can you share with us your experience on both the tribal and the government level? Um, I just want to say Isabel's inspiring. So I, I think that's so impressive the work she's doing, right? Um, you know, honestly, get, I, I had no idea there was a world of um, a policy. I didn't know when I went to college, um, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what I wanted or I literally was in my third year, like I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, when I graduated from uh, Western Washington University with my BA, I was working at the casino as a floor supervisor in table games. And so I'm a former craps dealer and uh, I like to say that craps has prepared me for, uh, for being able to work in politics because it's all about uh, relationships and personalities, right? And being able to uh, work through things. But I was really uh, angry because I didn't know, and I grew up on the reservation, so I didn't know things like uh, that we're a political class of people. I didn't know about the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. I didn't know why we had non no tax, right? I just knew I was sovereign. I didn't pay sales tax on my reservation. Um, and I could walk down the middle of the street on the res if I wanted uh, because I was sovereign, right? So I didn't know the reasons for the things we had. Um, and I also didn't know about boarding school. I didn't know about the federal policies that put my grandfather um, into work in the city and creating that urban way that that was actual federal policy of getting natives off the reservation um, and removing them from their place, right? And so there was just all of these things when I learned in college why we are what we are and that there's 200 years of federal law and policy that has dictated our lives to motherhood of Native women, taking away motherhood, you know, um, um, sterilization, like all these things. I was like, why aren't we talking about this? So when I got into uh, governmental affairs and realized there's this whole world of policy and like this is where it happens, that you can actually write change, you can write policy papers and create change and create momentum and demand um, your, your rights are upheld and demand that um, our people are treated humanely and justly. And I, I was just like, how come nobody's told us? Why, why am I 23 just learning this, you know? Um, and from then on, I've just been like, we have to talk to our young people about this at a much younger age. Um, federal Indian policy should be taught in sixth grade, you know, um, to our children. Uh, tribes, we should be taking it upon ourselves to be teaching Indian civics uh, mm -hmm. so that we can understand and be powerful. And recognizing that's what AIM was. AIM was powerful in our treaty rights and being able to debate, being able to articulate um, our, our rights and, and um, why we're fighting and why we're doing what we're doing. And so the biggest thing for me was that it's there and it's available, right? And so there's so many different levels um, of being policy, of doing policy work, of being elected. Like there isn't one way, there isn't a, you have to go to college, you have to do this and you have to do that. Um, it, it's so broad and open, you know, that it's really about the passion that you have in your heart. And I had no idea I was such a nerd um, until I started getting into federal policy. And then I was like, oh, this is my jam. This is my home, you know, um, and being able to make change. And so I just wanna advocate 
to anyone who who doesn't know what they want to do and doesn't know it's totally okay like keep trying to figure it out uh keep making momentum and um my three-year-old nephew is in the background now so <laughs> uh but just keep going and i was really my just it was just me um there wasn't i didn't have a bunch of people who who thought like me i felt really alone and i felt really um not with a place right um trying to figure out what my purpose was and um it, and so then you internalize that right going where's other people like me where's and it wasn't until i went to affiliate tribes in northwest indians conference um and ncai and i was like oh my gosh there's thousands of us who are super nerdy and and want to make change and want to do that um but on my reservation i didn't see it so i didn't know it was happening mm -hmm. and that's why i think national organizations being able to reach out to our youth at a younger age and getting them more engaged and having yeah. amazing ambassadors um, makes a huge difference for all of us in indian country mm -hmm. and so um I just I'm so thankful for for the Center of uh, Native American Youth and the work they're doing because it matters and our young people deserve a platform and they deserve the microphone um, because they have a lot to say and, and the leadership um, they deserve it and so step up and and keep doing an amazing job because uh, our Native youth are really leading us already. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and first of all you got a really good looking uh, nephew there second of all Thank you for those words and, and honestly, Teresa, just thank you for all the work that you do. I know that uh, we did an event, you know, not too long ago with the DNC and just, uh, and we're grateful that you're using your microphone, you know, because it's, uh, you're speaking up for us, you know, in places that a lot of our native youth don't think that they can speak up at. I like what Anthony said about, you know, go talk, you know, go talk to your representative and they'll make time. And, you know, we do have to get involved, you know. I know that you have to leave here in a minute before I, before I let you go. Uh, what are some encouraging words that you have for our Native youth uh, about voting and, you know, whatever else is on your heart? I, I think Anthony said it perfect is that um, we're purposely left out, right? We're purposely meant to feel like My we don't Anthony belong. My dad you. Your dad is Anthony. Um, and we're purposely meant to be ah, guarded. Hey, you've got to be respectful, okay? Um, and... And that's intentional. It's intentional. We don't feel a part of a system that was created from us, right? Mm -hmm. um, they took the three government branches from our people, and then they just uh, screwed it all up by, by excluding women. And so it's taken us like 100 plus years to get back to some kind of little bit of balance. Um, but know it's all intentional. Know that you're supposed to feel separate and isolated and not engaged because they and they are the ones who are benefiting. Um, the Trumps of the world benefit from us not being engaged. And so the white nationalists, the neo-Nazis, um, the all of the anti, you know, who we are benefit from us not being engaged. The prison pipeline, the school systems that are the systemic racism that they are indoctrinating in curriculum is absolutely impacting us. And so when we look at um, statistics of education and our native children are graduating at a 45%, it's intentional. That's on purpose because the power of a strong, brilliant native person, they're afraid of us, right? Mm -hmm. And so the more empowered we get, the more they come at us. And so um, please don't, don't take the right to vote as, as who cares, it's not good enough. And believe me, if your candidate of choice doesn't have a platform you like, contact them, email them and say, where's your native platform? Where's your native policies? Where are they? And if it's a mayor, a, a um, county commissioner, PUD elected official, judge, like whoever it is, ask them, where is your native portfolio? And even if there's not tribes, like in Chicago, there's a huge amount of urban natives. Where are, where, how will you address the urban native population um, in your area? And don't think you're ever um, not in the right place to do that because we need you to do that. We need you to call out candidates and say, where's your inclusion of Native American issues? And then if they do put one out and it's not very good, you can say, here, let me help you um, 
spell it out correctly, right? And so, um, because it's never uh, end all, we always can educate and we can always change. Policy is meant to be changed. Policy is not law. So you put out a bad policy, you change it, you correct it, and, and that's activism and that's engagement. Um, and all of us can do that. You, you don't have to be an, a lawyer or some a fancy title. Um, you can be a regular tribal citizen creating ginormous change um, by challenging the status quo. And so wow. we appreciate that. Wow. Hey, Teresa, thank, thank you very, very much. I know that, you know, you probably have to run here in a little bit. We want you to stay on the webinar, you know, as long as you can. But thank you for your words today. Thank you for your, your input and, you know, just your outreach. You know, we're doing some great things and, you know, uh, just keep on keeping on. You're babysitting and yeah. the world at the same time, man. We're grateful for that. Uh, I'm going to move over here to Anthony. Uh, you served in an elected office uh, as an elected official with the Center for Native American Youth, uh, uh, Youth Advisory Board. Uh, how have you and how will you use this platform in civil engagement, civic engagement? Yeah, so I think it's, you know, we're, we're involved in, in like these little mini democracies, um, uh, you know, of our own. Um, you know, so even for, for CNY sitting on the Youth Advisory Board, um, and then for also for for unity being elected as the Midwest representative, right? You know, those are two offices where um, I was elected by my peers um, and it's definitely something that's very it's a very humbling experience because um, You know in in those positions you, you work with people and those people become your family, right? They become your your second family and you know, just like your, just like your, your first family, you know, there's arguments, there's, you know, debates, there's um, figuring out different ways to, to work through issues. Um, but, but most importantly is using that position, you know, if, if you're in one of those elected positions is, is using that to not uplift your own voice, um, but to uplift uh, other people's voices, right? It's important to, you know, you, got elected for a reason, right? And so, you know, make sure that you're following through on those reasons, but that you're, you're able to open up your, open yourself up uh, to being held accountable. And so, you know, if there's something that I'm not doing uh, that I said I would do, or, you know, that, you know, one of my fellow youth don't think that I'm doing correctly, or that they think I can uh, improve upon, you know, it's, it's, using that as a, as a teaching experience and a learning experience for, for all parties involved, you know, to make it okay and to normalize holding people you elect into office uh, uh, accountable, right? Um, and so, you know, beyond that, uh, like I said, uplifting those youth voices, um, you know, learning accountability processes, but also, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're, it's on a little smaller scale. So we're able to, you know, reach out to people and we're able to get a feel for, for our own, uh, you know, our own leading styles, right? What works for us, what doesn't work for us. Um, but these positions, I would say, are, are just the beginning of, of what's yet to come from Native youth, um, you know, and from myself, right? You know, in, in the future, I, you know, it, it is my goal to go into uh, policy making and policy creation um, and, and to go in those positions and to be a member of Congress, right? To make sure that never again will youth in my community uh, feel like their voice isn't being heard. And so, you know, if that is, you know, means being that doorstop to make sure that people uh, can slide through and get a seat at that table, then I am more than happy to do that um, because it's something that, you know, that's one of the things that I enjoy doing, right? Like Teresa said, uh, there are a bunch of nerds. I am one of those nerds when it comes to uh, policy and and in terms of like getting people involved. You know, it's just something that, that fascinates me and that I think it's really important that, that we get our voices heard. Um, and the positions we're in now, like I said, is, is just the beginning uh, to use to, to learn for ourselves, but to learn for, for our peers. Wow, thank you for that. And I'm excited about you doing some policy making. Honestly, Anthony, just you know, knowing you, you know, over the years, uh, getting to know you. I mean, it hasn't been that long, but 
I see it. I see you going in that direction. I appreciate it, man. I really do. And I also like how you wear, how you roll your jeans up and wear your boat shoes. That was kind of cool. You made me want to do that when I got back home, man. <laughs> don't think I didn't. Don't think I didn't. Uh, I didn't notice that. Um, hey, uh, uh, Paulette, uh, you know, you you know, the last question's for you. Uh, you know, you won a lot of voters over, uh, you know, with the slogan of uh, rule America needs uh, representation. Um, how can we get adequate and proper rep representation and how would that uh, be in the best, the tribe's best interest? Well, rural America gets left out of the conversations um, more often than not. Uh, and just like tribal peoples, you know, we're, we're often uh, not at the table. Yet we have a lot to offer when it comes to, you know, our experience in ag tech or uh, land development or just, you know, caring for the land period. Uh, and we are largely agricultural in rural America. Uh, I grew up on my family farmlands, in fact. Uh, my grandparents were farmers uh, and ranchers on both sides. Uh, but people need to come to understand that uh, public health starts with our connection to our land and the food and the water sources we rely on. Uh, we learned from Standing Rock how important it is to protect water. We have all of our ceremonies around protection and honoring our relationship with water and all of our resources. Uh, and yet, you know, here we are in rural America, uh, where we're, again, not either at the table or in these rooms uh, speaking to these issues. And so I knew that if we could share this message and move it to the forefront of America, this will help change or shift the culture and even our economy. But these are all uh, ways to address all the issues that people are talking about. Uh, even now that we're dealing with COVID, you know, it's going to be more important than ever to uh, just discuss the, the nutrients that are in your body, because this is... Um, this is a novel virus that means that anyone and everyone is susceptible. There's no one that is immune. And so the best thing that you can do to fight back is essentially to get your exercise on, do eat right, make sure you're getting all the right nutrients. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, even the ag community struggle uh, and because of the politics and uh, the climate crisis that we're in. So uh, there's new conversations that are sprouting from this in rural America and that's food sovereignty. Uh, and of course, food nutrition. So we, we definitely have a role to play, but more, I think more voices from rural America are gonna rise up now um, as we're challenging both parties and the country at large when it comes down to these conversations that are wholly important from healthcare to education, to how those, are, uh, those folks who are economically suppressed uh, in these communities all across the country. You know, we, we have a, a financial crisis that we're dealing with with far too many people who are unemployed and haven't received unemployment checks. Uh, COVID relief is not hitting everybody. And of course, uh, that includes tribal peoples. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, it's an issue that matters to me most. And uh, coming in through the DNC and even being, uh, more importantly, a nonpartisan candidate being indigenous because our people are nonpartisan. We're, we're just about putting the people first. Mm -hmm. You know, and that will be that whole uh, voice of whether it's rural America or being indigenous, uh, those two collide and they intersect in so many ways. Uh, excuse me, but that's, that's to me what's uh, most valuable and what I offer uh, in my own campaign for the U.S. Senate, because this is the kind of leadership that I want to promote in the U.S. Congress. But uh, this is what I think the world needs to hear as well, uh, because we do have the keys. We have all the keys to uh, help not only connect people, but to connect everything and everyone uh, to nature and to uh, the resources by and large that we rely upon. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to stay here with you. Uh, I'm going to have a question. This last question is for all of us. I'm going to stay here with you. You know, what are some encouraging words, uh, Paulette, that you can, you know, you can encourage our Native youth to be excited about, about getting out and voting? Because, you know, if you're just now tuning in, listeners, you know, uh, Paulette um, Jordan uh, is running for a senator up in uh, the great state of Idaho. And it looks good. looks promising. Um, but for all of our panelists here, what is some encouraging words? That you have for our native youth about getting excited to vote, Paulette? I would say to everyone to find your passion. What moves you when you get up every morning? What is it that excites you? Uh, I heard from Isabel what excites her, you know, and I, I, that made me excited. Uh, and I heard from Tony what excites him, and that makes me ex excited because I'm, you know, I get inspired by young people like yourselves who are, you know, finding reasons to engage and, and stay connected. Uh, because you're getting younger and younger and like Teresa Sheldon who is uh, you know our sister from Tulela has said you know we sometimes we have our own points in our timeline where we come to 
uh, come to acknowledging ourselves or recognizing where we're at and what really truly moves us. And, you know, maybe hers came after college and she moved back to the reservation, but, uh, you know, we all come to that point uh, at some point in time. And I just, I want to just let young people know on this call or in this video that uh, one of the things that you have to do is put yourself in the most vulnerable position that you can possibly do. Uh, and if that's to run for office or to speak up at an event or to volunteer your time, uh, just to expose yourself and be open about these things that uh, you will find that there are more opportunities out there waiting for you to lead or just to be a part of these uh, conversations. And I, I implore every single one of us to do that because more of our people uh, from the Indigenous community must be heard from. We have to be part of all these conversations. And I think that's truly how we start to influence the world and the culture to get back into this right shift, but back into balance the way it should be. Mm, wow, powerful words, thank you. Uh, Isabel, how about you? You know, how can we, and some encouraging words to get our youth excited to get out and vote? So some, a saying like I keep having ingrained in my head, and I just wanna ingrain it in other youth's head, is that if your vote wasn't important, they wouldn't be trying to take it away. And I'm gonna give that credit to um, uh, Stacey Abrams, because that's who I heard it from. Um, but exactly that, like our vote is so incredibly important. And the barriers, yes, we've talked about the barriers Native people have, and that's unacceptable, but we have to continue be having that voice because it's worth it in the long run um, to make our vo votes matter, um, not only on our uh, local, uh, always on our local tribal and um, presidents, uh, you know, those are all important matters. And for Native youth to make sure that they have that voice in the running. But I also wanna um, encourage the Native youth who might have uh, criminal records or um, have that extra barrier to voting. I know many states make it harder for people with felonies or uh, any kind of conviction um, to vote. And I just wanna say like, make sure you continue to make your vo voice heard um, and call your, your representatives and tell them what matters to you and volunteer and make those phone calls. Because yes, I know the barrier to voting is difficult, but it still matters. And um, I just wanna say like my vote, um, like I'm always thinking about the vulnerable communities, like people with criminal records or, you know, our undocumented families. Um, we just have to continually thinking about others uh, as well as uh, what matters to us. Wow, thank you for that. Anthony, close us out. Yeah, you know, I think now more than ever, we're in a time where, uh, you know, I would encourage everyone, uh, youth, um, aunties, uncles, grandparents, uh, to practice accountability. Um, you know, each accountability is something that I believe is an indigenous practice as well. And we should be able to apply that to our elected officials and to people trying to get into those positions. You know, hold them accountable to their word. Uh, like Teresa said, you know, reach out to them if they don't have, um, a, you know, a native agenda, uh, you know, encourage them to get one. And if it's not a good one, encourage them to change it and reach out to Native communities and hold them accountable to that, right? Accountability is one of the strongest practices that I think, you know, any person can have uh, because you're calling something out that, you know, has, has caused harm or will cause harm and you're, you're preventing that, right? Accountability is a process that will, you know, stop these generations of trauma uh, you know, impacting Native communities, right? Accountability is something that um, is, is scary. It's scary to people who are in positions of power right now because they know, you know, if they're held accountable, you know, half of the things that they said they were do going to do or will do haven't been done or haven't been completed, right? And so, you know, but beyond that, you know, make sure you're holding yourself accountable. You know, if you say you're gonna go out and vote, you know, on voting day, make sure you make a plan to go vote. You know, that is an effective way to make sure uh, that you're accountable to your word, right? You know, hold your friends, your family accountable, make sure they go out and vote. You know, make sure that they're as involved as you are in the process because, you know, like I said before, it's, they, you know, you're not wanted uh, in, in, to be involved in this process, right? And so, you know, it's, it, you know, it's important to 
get out there and like John Lewis said, you know, cause some good trouble, right? You know, cause some trouble that, you know, is going to make people mad. And when you make people mad, you know, more than likely you're doing something right uh, because people don't like that. And I think as Native youth, uh, you know, we're constantly making people mad. Um, but for all the good reasons, you know, because we're fighting for the land, you know, we're fighting for our culture, we're fighting for our language, we're fighting uh, to make sure that our people agenda is heard. And so, you know, I think no matter what, um, you know, even if you're scared to make sure that you're, you know, you're as vocal as possible as well, because, you know, it, it, it can be very scary, even doing things like this for myself, you know, I still get all nervous and butterflies in my stomach um, before I go on and while I'm on, but you know, I I know that it's something important that we have to keep doing and we have to you know keep pushing for. Um, so I would encourage you to do you know to do the same because there will come a time where you know I will age out of my my youth and I will go into positions where you know I will need to mentor you, and you know, with the times we're in now, everything's constantly changing, and that. I fully expect that when I'm older, that I am held accountable even now. Uh, so it's best to practice that, you know, at the polls, in your homes, um, and in democracy. Wow. Hey, man, uh, I, I agree with everything except for aging out of your youth. I'm not ever going to age out of my youth, man. I'm always going to be 22. For, I mean, I'm always going to be 20 for the whatever, 27 time, doesn't matter. But um, yeah, I thought you were 27. 25. Yeah, 27th for the 19th time. 27th for the 19th time. Um, you know, one thing, Chance, um, that I forgot, uh, you know, and part of holding each other accountable, we can make sure that we're doing the, um, you know, the survey that CNAY is partnering with uh, okay. other organizations. So make sure that we're doing that. You can find that on their website um, because that is a way to hold yourself accountable, you know, commit to doing the survey. Um, and you know, you can be entered in some raffles too. There you go. Okay, great. I like that. <laughs> Don't forget to uh, check on that survey. Hey, uh, Isabel, Anthony, um, future uh, Senator uh, Jordan, we want to thank you guys for being, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to be part of our panel. Uh, this is our sixth webinar here at uh, Center for Native American Youth uh, at the Aspen Institute, uh, Tell a Native. Uh, join us next Wednesday. Man, we have a part two. Uh, music is, is medicine, I believe, a phenomenal lineup, one that you don't want to miss. You want to come right back here uh, on this uh, 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 Facebook page. Man, it's going to be a great concert. Um, truly is an honor, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, just know that we love you. We care about you. You're doing, you're doing some wonderful things out there. Don't let up. You know, uh, anytime you want to do something good, the opposition is always going to be there. Uh, thank you for joining us on Decolonizing uh, Democracy. I'm Chance Rush, your moderator. Thank you, panel, again. Love you all, and um, you guys have a blessed day. All right. Thanks, Chance. Thank you. Thank you.